In Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei holds the United States and the Israeli regime responsible for the current situation in Syria, where terrorist groups seize power. In Palestine, authorities denounce the Israeli forces' massive demolitions of a village in the northern occupied West Bank. And in South Korea, police raided the presidential office and police headquarters as part of the investigation into President Jun Suk Yeol. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Lesu Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. This year, Alba TCP celebrates its 20th anniversary. Next Saturday, Venezuela will host the 24th Summit of Heads of States and Government of the Alliance. Let's learn, let's learn more about its history in the following segment. Hello. On December 14th, Caracas will be the epicenter of the 24th Summit of Head of State and Government of the ALBA TCP. To know what this multilateral mechanism is all about, let's watch the following report. ALBA TCP is a regional international organization founded in 2004 by the governments of Cuba and Venezuela to counter the free trade area of the Americas promoted by the United States. ALBA TCP currently enrolls Latin American and Caribbean countries with the firm objective of fighting poverty and social exclusion based on leftist ideological doctrines. This mechanism prioritizes equality and the common good in relations between nations by fostering regional dialogue, by identifying areas for strategic alliances, and by promoting consensus and agreement among Latin American nations. The International Anti-Fascist Conference laid a fundamental proposal that all social movements worldwide should take ownership of the Bolivarian Alliance and its capabilities to strengthen their struggle to stop fascism forever. I am here to tell you about an experience, about a reality that emerged 20 years ago. What is ALBA? It was suggested by Hugo Chavez, but who created it? Hugo Chavez and Fidel Castro, no less, that is to say, that ALBA has foster initiatives that even today the BRICS regards as vanguard initiatives. And on a day like this, it is fitting to remember a phrase of Commander Hugo Chavez. ALBA is a dream come true. It is the hope of our peoples. With the statement, Chavez expressed the hope that ALBA represented for Latin American and Caribbeans as it offered an alternative to neoliberal models. And with the aim of building a new multipolar world, the leader of the Cuban Revolution, Fidel Castro, stressed the importance of ALBA in its creation. He said that ALBA is an integration project born out of the need to build a fairer and more equitable world. Fidel Castro stressed the transformative nature of ALBA, which sought to overcome inequalities and build a new world order. Continue joining us in Tell Us Your English throughout this special week as we follow the ALBA TCP 24th Summit in Caracas. Let's now go live with our correspondent in Caracas, Belen de los Santos, for all the latest in the run-up to this Saturday summit of ALBA TCP heads of state and government. Hello, Belen. Exactly, Luis. We are here in Caracas, and as we have been covering, this week marks 
20 years from the creation of the ALBA integration mechanism and we are in the house of ALBA today and as we were saying it's 20 years since the creation of the mechanism this was created by Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez in the year 2004 and it was intended to be and continues to be a mechanism that wanted to counteract or propose a new way, a new model of building solidarity opposed to the proposal of a free trade area for the Americas. So instead of a free trade area for the Americas that was rejected at the early 2000s, this mechanism, the ALBA, intends to build on solidarity, on cooperation, on an economic integration that is built towards the mutual benefit, benefit of all the member countries. So this was started by Venezuela and Cuba, then joined by, by Bolivia and then many other partners and also associates nowadays. And this week is key here in Caracas. Today we are at one of the first events that is within the week. The main summit will take place on Friday and Saturday, specifically on Saturday with the heads of state and government here in Caracas that are coming here to celebrate this anniversary, this 24th summit. But today in the House of Alba, we have a gathering of the Alba youth. So youth representatives from all the different Alba countries have come here together. And what they are doing is they are representing and recreating a political council for the Alba. So they are, this is really an activity to foster the internationalism, the cooperation among the youth of these countries to model what a really uh, an exchange, a cooperation, a discussion among the Alba countries is like. Of course, Alba is not only thinking about the integration today and this week as this has been uh, happening d during the week and during the year, but also it's thinking about the future. It's thinking about how this mechanism can be projected on the years to come so the youth, of course, play a central role in this area. So that is what is happening inside. We are outside the premises of the House of Alba right at this second. And while the youth are discussing, sharing their views on a very complex geopolitical world nowadays. Also, there are part of diplomatic bodies that come from the ALBA member countries who are observing the activity. They are looking and assessing and just taking in the activity that is being led by the youth as a model of how this cooperation mechanism works, has been working for the past 20 years and will continue to work. So this is one of the first activities in this week that celebrates the 24th ALBA Summit, as we had been saying. And of course, tomorrow we will have more um, more activities here in Caracas, also the social movements that are part of the ALBA movements are also coming and gathering on Friday. Also the foreign ministers are going to be gathering during this week and the week will have its climax, its main point on Saturday when the heads of state and government of these countries are going to come together, discuss the regional challenges and also all the possible roads for cooperation, for solidarity in this mechanism that really tries to show the world that there is a way for the countries to collaborate, to cooperate and to grow in which the economy is a means for the development of the peoples. So that is what this week is all about. We will continue to bring you all the information here from Caracas throughout the week. Today we are at the House of Alba and now I go back to you, Luis. Thank you, Belen, for the information. We'll stay tuned in upcoming news brief for everything that is happening today and throughout the week in the upcoming of the 21st Summit of the Heads of States of Government of ALBA. Let's now take a short break, but first remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you'll find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. We'll be right back. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The leader of the Islamic Revolution of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, blamed the United States and the Israeli regime for the situation in Syria, where terrorist groups seized power after overthrowing President Bashar al-Assad. The Iranian leader met Wednesday with thousands of Iranian citizens from different strata in Tehran to tell them they have proof that the plot was planned in command rooms in Washington and Tel Aviv. Furthermore, the Ayatollah claimed that a country bordering Syria was involved, which he might have referred to Turkey. In this sense, Hamane pointed out that these nations are seeking to take over lands in the north and south of Syria, while the United States aims at strengthening its presence in the region. Likewise, the Iranian leader denied speculations about the weakening of the axis of resistance, highlighting his confidence in the Syrian youth will expel the invading forces. It is crystal clear that the underlying foundations on the Syrian events were the making of a coordinated joint plan of action between the U.S. and Israeli command room. The main conspirators, the key plotters, and the control room are located in the United States and the Zionist entity. We have evidence of this, and it leaves no room for doubt or hesitation. Uh, while chaos and uncertainty are spreading in Syria, hegemonic media outlets are trying to whitewash the image of the terrorists who seize the capital, describing them as rebels and opponents of deposed President Bashar al-Assad. Concurrently, allegations emerge evidencing how the leader of the terrorist group was trained by the CIA and has been militating in ISIS and al-Qaeda for more than 20 years. Let's see the details in the following coverage. The recent seizure of Damascus and the overthrow of Bashar al-Assad plunges the country into a wave of violence led by the Syrian terrorist group Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, who is preparing to take control of the nation through fear and weapons. According to governmental allegations, they are being carried out with U.S. armed support. However, while chaos and uncertainty reign in the population, the hegemonic media such as CNN and its allies try to clean the image of the terrorist leader, qualifying him as a rebel and opponent of the now former President al-Assad, without mentioning previous crimes. These media sources make their best effort to paint in colors the gloomy political and social scenario in Syria, assuring that today there is joy and celebration, but instead, the attacks do not stop just as Israel takes the opportunity to extend its lands under the pretext of protecting its borders. The leader of this movement, which Washington now classifies as a rebel group, is Abu Muhammad al-Jalani, also the creator of the al-Nusra Front Group, an al-Qaeda branch. According to reports by some media dedicated to the truth, al-Jalani was trained by the CIA for five years at the Bukha camp in Iraq and has been an ISIS and al-Qaeda fighter for more than 20 years. However, in 2017, the terrorist leader had an international arrest warrant. Condemned the aftermath of the Israeli incursion into their territories. One of them was the head of the Colonization and Wolf Resistance Commission, Muayyad Shaban, who spoke out against the destruction of the Kirbet Al Tawil village nearby the Akraba city. In addition, the leader urged international human rights institutions to safeguard the Palestinian people from the systematic attacks of Israeli forces on settlers. The authority drew attention to the fact that Israeli bulldozers have demolished homes, agricultural lands, and the power grid serving the Kirbet Al Tawil area. In Palestine, the gas and civil defense warned of approaching to disrupting all services in the territory due to the Israeli aggression. Ending these services will affect over 2 million Palestinians. In this context, the civil defense denounced that since the onset of the Israeli offensive, the occupation forces have deliberately attacked their facilities and vehicles. It further blamed Israel and its staunchest U.S. ally for the destructive aftermath. The entity noted that an immediate and permanent ceasefire is necessary for humanitarian reasons, in addition to making sure aid arrives quickly. On Wednesday, South Korean police raided the presidential office and police headquarters as part of the investigation into the imposition of martial law by President Jung Suk-yeol. 
The raids were carried out at the government office, the Seoul Metropolitan Police Headquarters and the Parliamentary Police Headquarters. During a meeting with the Parliamentary Legislative Committee, the chairman of the Office for the Corruption Investigations of high-ranking officials, Ho Dong Woon, assured that a thorough investigation was underway and that Jun's arrests would be requested if the necessary conditions were met. President Jun is banned from leaving the country as he is under investigation for committing treason, mutiny and abuse of power, allegations that also hang over several senior government and military officials. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel and tell us all English, there you'll be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Found your break? Don't go away. Welcome back. The Haitian National Office of Civil Aviation reported on Tuesday the reactivation of operations at the Toussaint Louverture International Airport. This is the main airport of the country and had been closed after the attacks perpetrated by armed criminal groups against several airplanes of international airlines. On November 11th, armed criminal groups belonging to the Vivre Ensemble Coalition attacked the airport, some of the shots hitting a Spirit Airlines commercial aircraft that was about to land at the terminal. Several other airplanes were also hit as part of an offensive launched by the criminal coalition led by Jimmy Chelichier. According to official information, the air terminal is expected to start receiving international flights as of Wednesday. And the Bolivian Navy has added a robot to its ranks that can dump large amounts of water and fight off wildfires. The handmade robot, built by the Bolivian Armed Forces, will join the ranks in the fight against wildfires two months after fires ravaged at least 10 million hectares. The robot named Erizo was presented on Saturday in the city of Cachabamba by President Luis Arce. It can be taken directly to the heart of the fire and can carry 3.8 tons of water to put out the wildfires. In September and October, Bolivia experienced the biggest fires in 10 years, which led the government of President Arce to declare a national disaster. We congratulate the Bolivian Navy for the work it has carried out through its Department of Technological Innovation for having created four prototypes of forest fire trucks and a prototype of a firefighter Arizo, as well as for the consolidation of the National Center of Experts in Natural Disasters, which announced its creation on May 11th of this year. In the United States, an uncontrolled fire has forced the evacuation of about 6,000 people in the western Californian city of Malibu. The California Fire Department said the fire known as Franklin had burned more than 2,200 acres in less than 24 hours and was spread along the Pacific coast. It has forced the closure of roads and schools until further notice in central and eastern Malibu, home to more than 10,000 residents. Firefighters are working to extinguish the blaze, which started last night near Malibu Canyon Road and Malibu Creek State Park. Our trees are catching on fire. Houses are catching on fire. There was fire every single direction you look. You can't really see it right here, but we're in this kind of valley, mountain range area right now, and we're completely surrounded. There was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres on fire and embers flying everywhere. In Havana, Cuba, the eighth edition of the IIF International Electronic Music Festival will be held from December 11th to the 15th at Fabrica de Arte. IIF 2024 will begin with a day of 11 workshops and the showcase of new talents, one of the notices of this edition. It will be a space for learning, projection, and connection for emerging artists who will show their proposal 
to the industry professionals and established artists of human electronic music. From December 12th to the 15th, nights at Fabrica de Arte will include concerts and live performances with the fusion of electronic genres and traditional Cuban sounds. We have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website, telesolenglish.net. So join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesol English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.